Hi everybody and welcome to Ask Outcast, your weekly technology news and entertainment show. And um, just like I say, we're back after a much needed hiatus and also technical difficulties. Um, as you know, last week we were supposed to have Matt on. This is Matt, for you who don't know. And um, we were supposed to have him on last week, but we hit some technical hiccups with Ustream. But anyway, we have those fixed now. And just one thing before I run out of power, make sure that everything is plugged in here. Sorry, my, uh, I'm running on a laptop. Um, we're, we're here, we're back, and uh, we're trying to kind of get more people on and uh, just try to uh, have a little bit more fun with the show, and as you can see, George, George is watching, but he's not with us uh, today. So, um, but uh, we got Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi. <laughs> um, so, Matt, um, you are the author of the book Star Wars versus Star Trek. Yes. Right. Well, uh, allegedly, right? <laughs> um, yeah, yes. But um, I guess, I guess, um, kind of, kind of, you know, fill us in a little bit of the backstory about, you know, maybe a little bit briefly, like who you are and and yeah. and wh what you do and and uh, you know, so. Sure. Uh, my name is Matt Corbett. I'm a full-time freelance writer. I started out in the role-playing game industry doing uh, tabletop games like Dungeons and Dragons for many years. I ran a company called Pinnacle Entertainment Group. We did a game called Deadlands and another game called Brave New World amongst a number of other uh, pretty decent selling award-winning games. Uh, I left that company back about 11 years ago when my son Marty decided that he would go to, or my son Marty, Marty was born, and we decided that we wanted to move back to Wisconsin. So I've been doing full-time freelance ever since then, essentially. Uh, most of these days I do um, comic books, role-playing games, uh, or comic books, computer games, and novels. And occasionally I do a non-fiction book, like I did the Book of Extreme Facts coming out from IDW Publishing this summer. And of course I did the Star Wars versus Star Trek book that just came out from Adams Media last month. Awesome. So yeah, I, I was reading some of your stuff. Um, you were you were doing some tabletop stuff early on uh, with White Wolf, weren't you? Or is that? Yeah, I haven't done too many things with White Wolf over the years. I have a lot of good friends there. Uh, I did a number of uh, fiction bits for them over the years, mostly uh, vampire fiction and things like that. Yeah. Um, I only did one game design project for them. That was uh, Ghost Stories, which was one of the first adventure books, first books ever that came out for the New World of Darkness a few years back. Okay. Yeah. No, I used to. Uh, Used to be a storyteller for Vampire yeah. the Masquerade, and uh, I've done quite a bit of uh, um, uh, stuff with uh, Kindred of the East. Uh, kind yeah. of like actually, one thing we experimented was meshing, you know, Vampire the Masquerade with Kindred of the East, and uh, you actually took pe people that were from the main line of Vampire into the Umbra, <laughs> that was part of the Kindred of the East storyline. It was kind of kind of cool. Our primary uh, focus was the New Orleans. Uh, storyline because this is while I was living in Pensacola, so it was a oh, okay. it, 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 it was the uh, closest uh, enclave that we could relate to. So it was a it was kind of a it was a pretty neat story and maybe yeah talk about it some other time offline. But it was a uh, I sure. still got, I still I still got all my uh, still got all my paperwork <laughs> as you as you keep <laughs> these things. Yeah, those, uh, things, those things never seem to go away. Do they? No. Uh, yeah, you, you just have a stack of stuff from storytelling in. Exactly. But um, the game you were playing at the time, yes. So um, I know this happened a little while ago. So since you since you've played in that space, mm -hmm. kind of like what do you what's your take on Blizzard taking over Wizards of the Coast? How do you mean? Um, well, what well, didn't Blizzard buy Wizards of the Coast a while ago? Oh no no um, no! Blizzard doesn't own Wizards of the Coast. That's Hasbro actually bought Wizards of the Coast. Oh my mistake. That's okay. I mean, it's an easy mistake to make. There are some people who think that fourth edition, which is the latest version of Dungeons and Dragons, hews pretty closely to World of Warcraft, or at least kind of reaches out towards people who play MMO, so they can understand it more easily. Mm -hmm. So I can see where people make the, that uh, confusion. But it was uh, actually purchased by Hasbro about, God, seven or eight years ago now, something like right. that, maybe a little bit longer. 
And uh, that was back at the height of the Pokemon craze, right? Back right. when Wizard was also publishing the Pokemon card game. Right. And the guy, I think it sold for something like $450 million total. The guys there made a killing. It was wonderful. It was wow. A number of very happy friends of mine. <laughs> uh, yeah. These... So I, do, you, do you think that, you know, this is going to cause allow some of the tabletop games to become a little bit more mainstream because of this purchase? Or, are they, or do you think it's still kind of like to this target niche market? Well, you know, I think uh, tabletop games are limited by the fact that they're limited by the fact that you need a really good game master to really get the most out of them, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a really good game master, there's nothing that beats them. It's like watching Shakespeare in the Park uh, being put on by the Royal Shakespeare Company, right? It's fantastic. Right. You get the best stuff going. On the other hand, uh, for most people, uh, most of us just don't have those skills. Most game masters don't have those skills. Most players don't have those skills. So uh, most of the time, you're going to get a, a substantially decent experience out of a game like World of Warcraft now or any of the other MMOs out there. So the impetus to go and learn the game and you know sit down and gather everybody around a table has gone down over the years unfortunately. But um, and that's the reason like television is easier to do than you know watching a live play. But that doesn't mean live plays die off. It just means they're not as popular as they once were. They're, they're just a, catering to a smaller niche because of that, right? Yep, no, um, absolutely. So I think you know one of the things you'll see, though, is a lot of the tabletop stuff tends to influence the, the computer game stuff. A lot of the prototyping for computer game stuff is done on the tabletop, even if it's just done privately in the development studio. Right. Um, and, you know, things like hit points and armor class and skill levels and, you know, just even levels and all. All that stuff comes from Dungeons and & Dragons and role-playing games originally. Right. And now it's become part of our modern-day vocabulary. Everybody knows what that stuff means. Right, yeah. Now, D&D de definitely... Uh, started the way and that was that was back in the early 70s yeah I, definitely so yeah game i mean you know get, the gamer culture has been there for a long time just people and not more, more and more people are becoming part of it so oh yeah we're on yeah. third generation gamers nowadays i mean awesome I mean, that's just counting from role-playing games on up i mean there are a number of people who are playing um you know traditional war games in the 50s right right things like panzer leader and squad leader and all that kind of stuff if you go way back, you go to H.G. Wells doing it around the turn of the last century when he came out with Little Wars, which is probably, which is considered to be the first serious uh, war game rules ever written. Okay. Right? Guys not only started a whole lot of science fiction and fantasy stuff, mostly science fiction, but also in one sense actually started the gaming industry. That's cool. I, di I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a pretty rare fact. I've had to teach it to college professors before. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you learned it here first. Well, not there first, but um, so now um, it kind of leads us to like, what about some of your um, latest fiction that you've been working on? What's uh, what's uh, what's kind of like yeah. on the top of your list that's fresh? Well, I have two novels, original novels that came out this year uh, from a company called Angry Robot Books. You can go to angryrobotbooks.com, and that's uh, an English publisher. They're founded by a guy named Mark Gascon, who used to be the publisher for the Black Library, which did all the Warhammer uh, fantasy mm -hmm. novels and all the other Warhammer books from Games Workshop. And I had written a number of uh, Blood Bowl novels from Marco back in the day. Right. Um, I... were based on the board game, which is now a PC game as well, an Xbox game. Um, and he commissioned a couple of original novels from me. So the first one came out in the U.S. in January, and it was called Immortals. And it's a story about a Secret Service agent who's the oldest man in the world, uh, because he can always have his brain backed up into a computer and then restored into a clone body if he gets killed, right? Yep. So the world's oldest man gets murdered on on television, it's released onto the internet, and now he wakes up in a new body and has to go out and uh, solve his own murder. So it's kind of an interesting thriller murder mystery going on in a awesome. science fiction setting. Uh, the second novel is called Vegas Nights with a K, and it's about a couple of college freshmen who uh, learn a little bit of magic and then decide, you know, hey, this we could probably get rich using this if we just gave it a little bit of effort. So they decide they're going to go to Las Vegas on their spring break and clean the tables, right? Right. Um, unfortunately, like most smart kids who go to Las Vegas figuring they got it all figured out, they find out they're not the first people to have thought of this stuff. Right. And they get their clocks clean, and it gets it spirals out of control from there. Awesome. Now, now the you mentioned the, um, I'm sorry, the title of the first book. the uh, Immortals. A Immortals. Now, it, is there... Now I've I've read Altered Carbon by Neil yeah, Stevenson. Yeah, I read Altered Carbon too. In fact, um, 
when I first pitched this book to Marco, yeah. he said, oh, is that altered carbon? I said, what, what's altered carbon? <laughs> <laughs> um, I said, oh, damn, I should go read that. So I did. I went and picked it up and read it. I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, this is really a good book. And he, uh, Morgan's yeah. a hell of a writer. Um, and I came back to Marco with a book a few years later because uh, I had pitched this originally to him when he was running Solaris over at uh, Games Workshop. And I said, you know, this is the, you know, there's a lot of the same notes in this story, right? But it's an entirely right. different song. No, and absolutely. Different characters, different themes, different everything else going on. In the background details about uh, being able to back up your brain into something, sure, that's there. But even that stuff's substantially different. So, right. Uh, no. If you read one, don't feel like you've already read the other. Oh, uh, no, and I, was, I wasn't trying to make that inference. I was just saying, you know, if you liked All of Good Carbon, you might like this book as well. Yeah, I think yeah. it actually it says that in the back of the book. Okay, <laughs> awesome. So uh, it's a, uh, um, and I, I just that type of genre, cyberpunk type books, I really kind of enjoy. And actually, my favorite book of all time, I haven't found one that beat it out yet, was a, has been Snow Crash. So, oh yeah, uh, great stuff. Yeah. I grew up on all that stuff. You know, Neuromancer yeah. and. Uh, Bruce Sterling, William Gibson, all that great stuff. Yeah. Well, I, um, Snow Crash is kind of what inspired me to start getting involved with doing virtual environments. And uh, I've done some freelance work myself uh, around oh. set, Second Life and uh, some other virtual yeah. environment type work. So I, I just, that good genre of books, I'm definitely going to try to check that one out. And that's uh, pretty awesome. I, I can't wait to actually read that one. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, but. Um, Kind of like what we what we brought you here to talk about uh -oh. is, is is Star Wars versus Star Trek. Two things that are very important to me, and <laughs> um, and just kind of uh, basically, um, you know, if you want to break it down for us uh, a little bit, it's basically you know who can kick whose butt between Star Trek and Star Wars. It's an ongoing right. it's an ongoing epic battle between uh, fans. Exactly. I mean, it's the, it's the classic geek argument, right? You know, what's better, Star Wars or Star Trek? You know, um, it's, you know <laughs> do you like chocolate or peanut butter? Honestly, could you mix them, it would be great. But um, basically, it's, it's, uh, it's a humor book. It's found in the humor section. So, you know, try to take it too seriously. It's not meant to be one of these books like the science behind Star Trek, the science behind Star Wars or anything like that. But it, it uh, takes different elements from both the Star Trek and the Star Wars universes and then pits them up together against each other. And it has little short fiction bits that explains or visualizes how this might transpire, what might cause them to conflict, and what might happen if they conflict. Um, like, for instance, we have uh, Captain Kirk versus Han Solo, right? Or Data versus C-3PO. Or the Borg Cube versus the Death Star. Things like that. Um, you know, what would win? It also has some... Uh, and there's a number. Of, there's 20 different trivia questions in the book, or tw uh, trivia quizzes in the book, uh, which is like 120 different questions. And if you answer them all, it'll kind of tell you at the end whether or not you're really a big Star Wars geek or a Star Wars geek by just which one you get the most answers right for, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's all sorts of little bits of trivia in there, and little, little toss-outs to uh, nods to geek culture. Um, it's got a foreword by Jeremy Bullock, the guy who did Star Wars versus Star Trek. I mean, I'm sorry, did uh, <laughs> that was you. <laughs> Sorry, he did Boba Fett, exactly. And uh, Tim Russ, who was Tuvok on Voyager, right? Right. Um, right. And actually, Jeremy Bullock, he wanted uh, to cast a connection back to the uh, role-playing game industry. The guy, the woman who put me in charge, or put me in touch with Jeremy, was Lisa Stevens, who's now in charge of Paizo, who used to be one of the, I think it was employee number one at Wizards of the Coast. Okay. And now she runs one of the largest role-playing company, companies in the world called Paizo Publishing and her Pathfinder game. But she also was the president of the Star Wars fan club for many years. Oh, that's that's right. I, I I knew I recognized that name. So yeah. So yeah, you can't get a bigger Star Wars fan than her. So when I was looking for somebody to write the forward, I called up Lisa and said, "Lisa, do you think you can help me out here?" And she's, "Oh, I know just the guy. Jeremy's a gentleman and a scholar and all that. And he really was. He was the sweetest guy." And awesome. we had another friend, Sarah Char, put me in touch with uh, Tim Russ, and Tim was just great too. They just both did an excellent job. Yeah. I think in the ebook uh, we have also forwards from uh, Mike Stackpole did the Star Wars one. Mike okay. did a number of Star Wars novels way back in the day. Okay. And uh, Ken Height, who's a buddy of mine again from the role playing game industry, did the Star Trek one because he did a number of uh, books for the Star Trek role playing game from Last Unicorn Games and then from Decipher Games after that. Yeah. 
I, 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 I was going to try the Star Trek one. I just ha I never got a chance to do it. I have played the Star Wars one, which is based on the D20 system. Uh -huh. And the Star Wars, the Star Wars tabletop was pretty good. Um, I mean, if you're if you're a D and D fan and you like the D twenty system and you you want you want to you know throw some Star Wars in there, I mean that's oh, de yeah. de really definitely well. and just the the, the depth of um, attributes and uh, um, of what you can be in that particular game, yes. I think is really really cool. Um, yeah, I mean, you can be pretty much any alien. You can create your own alien. Everything. It's just, it's a really, really dynamic uh, um, game if you ever get to play that one. But, yeah, um, it's good fun, you're right. I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to Star Wars The Old Republic coming out soon, too. Yeah, that is it? That's a ton of fun. Yeah. Well, I'm waiting for the new MMO being put out by BioWare. Oh, that's the one. That's the MMO, Star yeah. Wars The Old Republic. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you there was a tabletop Star Wars. No, no, no. I, uh, somebody might be working on it, but I don't know if they are or who it might be. Yeah. <laughs> Is that you or me? <laughs> Anyways, um, so well, I'm kill. Okay. Yes. Um, so basically, I, I I just you know I've been reading the book you know reading bits and pieces where when I can when I get time, um, I believe I, I you know this is just something you know you read a few pages at night before you go to bed and you have a good chuckle. Uh, with your partner, if they if they happen to be a Star Wars or Star Trek fan, um, I, I think I think one of my favorite ones, and I, I told you this before, is the comparison between Emperor Pal Palpatine and Q. I, I, Q has <laughs> got to be one of my favorite, most favorite characters from Star Trek, just because he's such a um, I, you know out there character, and he's just. Such he, a smarmy smartass, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, he knows everything. <laughs> the most evil, serious, grumpy old bastard you ever saw, right? Yeah. You match him up against you, who just outclasses him at every level, of course. <laughs> and it's good fun. Uh, I just if you get a chance to read that, that starts on page seventy one of the book. That's just I, I don't I don't want to spoil the punchline on that one because it's just you will okay. it just you roll down laughing funny. On that one. Thank now, you. now there's a few things I have run into this book. Some sure. points of contention that I have with uh, <laughs> so, some of your conclusions. And I guess sure. what what That's uh, why I wrote the book. You know, this is a step in the ongoing argument. I can't imagine that this will be a final say in anything. Right? Yeah. Right. No. Absolutely. And I I, I, I can imagine there's going to be like a part two that comes out to to correct some mistakes from before or or. Um, um, maybe to, to make some new comparisons, but um, sure. now I, 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 I will admit the Captain Kirk versus Solo one. Uh, okay. I, I, I thought that could have been a little bit more exciting. <laughs> but, but yeah, that was more of an avoiding one, you know. But that's the thing about Solo; he doesn't like to fight. I know. It's like it's hard, right? He's he's the kind of guy who slips away if he ever has a chance. He's a scoundrel. He's a thief, right? Yeah. He's the, yeah, he's, uh, he likes to skulk around, and he swaggers out when he thinks he's in charge. But as soon as the top, things get tough, he gets the hell out of the way and so he has the advantage, but he's smart that way. Yeah, no, Whereas no. Kirk, very different kind of personality, right? Yeah. And, and, and I, yeah, I, I, know, I completely agree, and, and I just, when I, when, I, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, no! But yeah, I, I, I thought about it, analyzed it, and I go, that actually was the, that's exactly, that's exactly what would happen. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it could be fun if you put him in a cage match and watch him box it out, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what I was expecting. Yeah, I mean, if you could put uh, Han Solo in a Gorn suit and just have him beat, a, beat the hell out of Captain Kirk with each other <laughs> on an alien landscape, that would be fun. But, yeah, we didn't have the budget for, for filming that. So. <laughs> so I went with something that was a little more uh, entertaining on the page, I thought. You could actually go to the uh, Star Trek New Voyages guy, and I'm sure they would find a way to do it. Oh, probably, actually. There's some pretty amazing stuff being done there. Yeah. In fact, Tim Russ is one of the guys behind that. So. Yeah, I, the, the, the new Voyages stuff. If you guys don't, if you guys haven't seen it, go Google Star Trek New Voyages, and it is some of the most ridiculous and some of the best fan-based Star Trek you'll ever see. And the thing about it is, though, the thing that makes it so enjoyable is that that's what Star Trek was. It was very oh, silly yeah. at times. It was it was cheese upon cheese, and that's what made it great. 
And and, well, and the neat thing now is they just started streaming it all on Netflix again, just on July first, I guess, right? So now you can see all the old ones again. Yes. Uh, you know, if you happen to have a Netflix subscription. So. Yeah. That 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 I've been waiting for that. I've been waiting for that because yeah. I'm I'm getting my Star Trek marathon on because they're going to be doing Next Generation as well, I believe. And Voyager and Deep, already up. Deep Space Nine is not out yet, but it should be on October right here. Yeah, so I'm I'm just it, it it's gonna take me back to when you know I was in junior high and high school, and and not to make you feel old, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, don't, kids do a good job of that anyway. I don't need to worry about it. But um, I, I I grew up on the original Star Trek. I mean, before Next Gen was uh, even around, I was I remember being seven eight years old, and my dad going. You know, oh, Star Trek reruns, let's watch them, you know, and when we would, yeah. you know. And I, and I think the most ridiculous episode from the original series was the Series 3 episode where... That's a tough contest. You know? <laughs> well, I'm so, if you go back and look at Seasons 1, 2, and 3 of the original Star Trek, Season 3, you, you see why it got canceled. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's because Roddenberry got... got pushed out and there was a lot of stuff that happened behind the scenes so he kind of mentally checked out during, during season three yeah. and um and it was just like the the spock hanging out with the hippies that was <laughs> that was that was the most ridiculous episode period and yeah it, that would do it of course and the one that's in a close second is the one where kirk loses his memory he ends up with that like native Native American tribe on some planet someplace. That one was pretty ridiculous, too. But, um, yeah, you know, I don't care if they're ridiculous as long as you're not boring, right? That's the whole thing. As long as they entertain little, you on some level, they can be silly. Right. Okay. As, as long as you don't take it too seriously, you'll do all right. Oh, exactly. But, but remember, it's just TV fiction, right? Right. Absolutely. So my, my question is, for, for you, because, you know, you sound like you're both a Star Wars and Star Trek fan. Oh, yeah. What what was the hardest comparison you had to do from this book? Do you think? Huh. That's a good question. Um, you know, I think the, one of the more interesting ones was the uh, the red shirts versus the stormtroopers. Right? Oh yes, because <laughs> you got the guys who get killed all the time versus the guys who can't hit the side of a barn. <laughs> uh, you know what happened? How did they get? How did the red shirts manage to kill themselves when nobody can actually hit them? <laughs> It gets very tricky that one. Yes. Um, but I came up with a few different ideas, and you know, uh, of course, it ends in a draw. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course it does. Because you got the red shirt. Happen in their own ways. <laughs> awesome. Now, um, now, which one? Now, which one was your most favorite comparison? Do you think? Which that one might were, be it too? I think yeah, that was a good one. Although I did like the the uh, emperor versus. Cute bit. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that actually, one. The one I had most fun with, I think, was the one at the end of the book, which uh, isn't actually a comparison so much as like a little bit of an idea about what would happen if the uh, if the Empire tried to invade the Federation, right? Right. Uh, what would you do if you actually mix the entire both the universes at once and had a uh, intergalactic war going on between them? I thought that was a lot of fun to do. Yeah. No. That that that, that was. I read that one, and that was pretty. You know, just refreshing my memory here, and that was. That that was pretty drawn out. I I I've got a I I, I it, it does um I, I you know I, I have to say for the most part your comparisons were fair and you, I think <laughs> for about ninety five percent you called it right and I, I, I and and, and well, I'm glad if I hit you with ninety five percent I think we're on the same page at least that's a good thing yeah I'm sure there are people out there who think that I didn't near nearly that close to it. But, you know, the fact is I love both the series, right? It's not yeah. like I'm, uh, I'm dedicated to one over the other. And they both have their flaws. I mean, there's some really awful Star Wars and some really awful Star Trek out there. And there's really some great stuff in it, too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm not a slavish devotee to either one. I think they're, uh, they both have wonderful aspects to them. It's what inspires the love in the first place. But then, you know, some points you go, oh, you know, what the hell are they thinking? And, you know, how did that get through or anything like that? Yeah. Um... I'm having a, we're having a little signal trouble with the Skype here. Uh, yeah. I'm hearing you just fine so far. All right, we're just having a little trouble hearing you, but we'll we'll continue on our way. Um, I'll shout louder. Yes. 
Um, so I got a question. What do you think how JJ, J, JJ Abrams' take on the Alpha timeline went? What's the? Thanks a lot. Uh, I have another little story about that. Actually. I worked on a toy product for Playmates Toys called the Star Trek World was it up here? Star Trek Command, Starfleet Command Mission Utility Belt, right? And it's, a, a, it's what they call a role play kit for kids, where you get a belt that's got a phaser and a communicator in it, right? Right. And uh, you wave the communicator over the belt, and the voice of Starfleet Command sends you out on different missions as either Mr. Spock or Captain Kirk. Um, and they hired me to write the dialogue for it. So that was kind of cool. I really enjoyed that. Um, but I, I, in order to, be able to write the dialogue for it, I needed to read the script. So after Comic-Con that year, one of the guys from Playmates, Pat Linden, drove down and picked me up at Comic-Con at like 7 in the morning, drove me up to the Paramount lot, and I got to sit in uh, Abrams' offices and read the script, right, about a year before the movie came out. Oh, wow. Um, they had me strip everything out of my pockets, including pens, cameras, Phones, everything. So I couldn't even take notes. I had to do it all from memory after that. Oh, wow. Uh, but it was, I guess we didn't see it. And this was during the writer's strikes. They weren't allowed to change any of the dialogue, right? When they were shooting the film, they were allowed to cut things out. They weren't allowed to alter things or add new things. Um, I thought you did a really good job of it. I really enjoyed the film quite a lot. I took my, I don't, my eldest son and my wife out. We went out to an open and had a ball with it. Awesome. So, um, any, so, you know, they're going to be working on the new one soon. I think they may even be actually working on the script at the moment because um, it's supposed to have... I think they are. Yeah, because it's got a 2012 release date as it stands currently. And... Um, That'd be coming. You know, can I, can, I, can I just do one quick thing is hang up this call and call you right back because sure. we're still having a bit of a trouble at it. It's hard to understand. Hey there. Uh, that's, that's a little bit that better. better. Yeah. Just slightly, I can understand you now a little bit better. So, um, now you may not be able to say, but ha has there been any hints to what the plot might be that you might know of or anything I you may... I zip about the new book. Uh, I'm not in... I, for one thing, I, I have to sign an NDA every time I work on something like that. Yep. I mean, it's a non-disclosure group. It says I can't actually say anything until... Uh, until the films are, or the information's been made public. Uh, but I can say without reservation, I have nothing to do with any toys coming out yet, the new one. All right. Uh, when I got they actually finalize everything and they start putting the stuff out to Playmates, they might hire me on again to do more stuff for it, but we're still looking at that. Yeah. I'm I, I just doing my job. i got to ask the question. No, no, that's okay. You're allowed to ask. I'm just... Not I'm allowed to tell. <laughs> um, so, now, I got... I, I got um, so what, which which is your out of both both realms Star Wars is, which is your favorite alien? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. Um, see, there's so many good ones in there, you know. I always I, I'm gonna cop a little bit there. My favorite group of aliens has got to be the guys who are playing the cantina bar when they first walk in in Mos Eisley, right? Um, it just sets the tone of everything so well. It's just this crazy, jazzy blues band made up of aliens that are just out of every different world. And as a group, they work together well, but they're in this seedy dive of a bar, right? Just perfect setting for everything. Right. The, the, yeah, you can imagine how, the, how, that, um, how that went, too, you know? You, you, there, there's just like this group of uh, aliens that travel from planet to planet and trying to do gigs, yeah. you know? They just... They're they they're they're life uh, roadies and they're just trying to trying to make the couple of couple of credits right. <laughs> exactly, and you know, think about the actors. You know, the guys who have to design all that stuff. Like Lucas says, I need a half dozen aliens in a band. Go. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Okay, we'll figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they did a hell of a job with. The, probably every one of those has their own action figure now, right? Right, right. Well, I mean, you can. But the you, didn't think anything of it. Well, I mean, if you've been playing the Star Trek role-playing game, you can go. You, you can go to my Sizely. You can go to the canteen and see them. Yeah. You know, so they're there. Um, I guess. I guess my. Um, I had another question. What was it? 
I, re I really should write these down. It would make interviews and things go a lot more smoother. Um, right. It's easy. It's live on the internet. Yeah, I bug easy. bugger. I told you this thing was unscripted. <laughs> <laughs> Completely unscripted. Um, so you it's good. It's all that, good. That's right. Um, now, now, do you have what else? Now you got the two. You got the Immortal and the um, Vegas Knights coming out, or yep. they're already out. They're already out. Uh, Immortals came out in January. Vegas Knights came out in March, I think, April, okay. something like that. Uh, depending on what, if you're in the UK or the US. Uh, I have uh, the Star Wars vs. Star Trek book came out. I've got a couple short stories that just came out. Uh, one in an anthology for steampunk called Hot and Steamy, which was about steampunk romances. Okay. Um, I had a G.I. Joe novella come out from IDW as part of the Tales from the Cobra Wars anthology. Oh, wow. That was a lot of fun to work on. Um, what else did I come out recently? I have uh, the Book of Extreme Facts coming out from IDW that I co-wrote with Chris and Prisco over there. And that's kind of like uh, uh, Guinness Book of World Records meets Ripley's, believe it or not, meets all sorts of wacky shows, reality shows, uh, kind of cut for the 12 to 14-year-old crew, right? Right. Uh, great illustrations all the way through. The guys at IDW always do great, uh, great artwork. Um, I have I signed another novel for Angry Robot that's going to be coming out next year in time for the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, okay. and it's called Carpathia. Um, Carpathia is the name of the ship that picked up the survivors from the Titanic. Right. It's also the name of the mountain range from which tran uh, set in Transylvania, from which Count Dracula hails. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is essentially. 30 Days of Night meets Titanic. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, the, the ship that picks up the survivors is full of vampires. It just gets worse from there. So. <laughs> Not only have you had a bad day, you're going to have a bad <laughs> he evening. Thought, he thought that hold on, the icy Atlantic was tough. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Dan awesome. <had> easy. <laughs> so, any, so, and I, I guess to, uh, where can we go to get the latest news about things you're working on, things you're doing, and just sure. anything that's from that's that, that's coming from Matt Forbeck. Well, you go to Forbeck.com. It's F-O-R-B-E-C-K.com, and I try to update that a couple three times a week, maybe more if I'm in the middle of doing something crazy. Uh, it's got a list of everything I'm doing on there. Um, in fact, I refresh my memory by looking at it right now. I forgot to mention I did some writing for Ghost Recon Online, which is a free-to-play MMO that's that's in beta right now and should be available in the fall. Um, that's based on the Tom Clancy series Ghost Recon. Oh, so you, okay, so you're involved with that. Okay, so we know who to yeah. blame. <laughs> yeah, sure, I'll take the blame. <laughs> they they got good checks. I'll take the blame for that. That's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, that's coming out sometime in the fall, and they've already started going. I think they're doing live beta in, or closed beta in Europe right now. Okay. Um, I had the Conduit Two come out earlier this year, which I did some back story background for, which was a game for the Wii from High Voltage Software. And my pal Jason Blair actually did the scripting for that. Um, I'm doing a couple, a little bit of work on a couple different MMOs. One of them was the Marvel Superhero Squad MMO, which I was working on for the guys at Lone Shark Games. They hired me on to do some writing for that. Um, got a movie coming out sometime this fall called Inspectors from a group called Reactor 88 Studios that I do some work with. And uh, I helped produce the film and I co-wrote the film. I also got to, pro uh, it's a low budget affair, but it's a lot of fun. It's based on Inspectors by Jared Sorensen, who's uh, uh, wrote this uh, indie role-playing game. Jared's a great designer, and it's basically Slacker Ghostbusters, right? So, awesome. Uh, I get to play a zombie in the movie too. But I'm in the opening reel where I kind of shuffle across and. Uh, uh -huh. Brains. <laughs> exactly. So it's good fun. Um, you know, I'm just I got a lot of kids to feed, so I'm always trying to do new things and have good fun with it. Um, mostly it involves writing. <laughs> right. And well, So go to Forbeck.com. You can follow me also on Twitter at M Forbeck, M -F -O -R -F, I'm sorry, M -F -O -R -B -E -C -K. And I tweet a lot, probably incessantly. You can always shut me off if you don't like it, but I'm there a lot. So. <laughs> right. Well, and, 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 we'll, and we'll put all those links and everything in the show notes uh, when, we, when I upload to YouTube. Very cool. But, yeah, I mean, I, I try to be out there having fun with people. You know, I'm, uh, I just – was put up for a dream date for the Ennies at Gen Con this year. I don't know if you know what Gen Con is. It's the world's or the 
Yeah, it's the world's largest role-playing game convention, right? Yeah, yeah. And no, I'm, I'm familiar with that one. Um, and com um, obviously there's Comic-Con as well, but that's a, yeah, like a, that's a mix of everything, though. Yeah, Comic-Con's really a pop culture show. There's less comics there than there used to be by a long way. Uh, and there's a bigger game, uh, tabletop game convention in Germany called the Spiele Show, which happens in Essen in October. Uh, and they have about 150,000 people show up. Gen Con has about 30,000, 35,000 people show up. But it's mostly concentrated on role-playing with some card games and board games and other types of games in there as well, miniature games. Right. But mostly role uh, cool. But it's the largest one in this hemisphere, for sure, and I would think the largest role-playing game convention. And I'm always uh, a big supporter of that. Gen Con's my favorite time of year. Uh, it's, they call it the best four days of gaming. For me, it's like a family reunion every August. Right? I get to go back and see all my old friends, mm -hmm. see a lot of the people I've, I've written stuff with and the people I've written stuff for and a lot of my fans and readers. It's just a blast, right? Yeah. Um, this will be my ninth year in a row, I think, being a guest of honor, uh, and my 30th Gen Con in a row because I've been going since I was you know, very young. <laughs> I grew up in southern Wisconsin where the convention was, so I've been going okay. since I was like 13 or 14 years old. Um, and the, uh, they just put me up at, on auction. If you go to my website, you can read about this, uh, to raise money for the Ennies, which are from the role-playing game awards from enworld.com or .org. I forget what it is. And uh, that's the premier role-playing game awards now. And they're trying to raise some money to make sure they can pay for the statuettes and everything else. Right. Uh, so they take a bunch of us guests of honor, and they say, would you guys be willing to auction off your time during the cocktail hour or during the, or have somebody sit next to you at the award ceremony uh, and try to raise some cash that way. So, yeah, now people can go and bid on a chance to have a drink with me <laughs> on eBay. So awesome. It says I am new. I don't think I'm in box, but I'm new. I don't know if I actually <laughs> trans and, and in good condition. Yes, and maybe near mint condition. I'm not sure. I don't. Uh, maybe they're thinking about the books because I'm actually tossing in some books for people. Whoever wins the uh, the auction, I'll toss in a copy of Immortals, a copy of Vegas Nights, and a copy of Star Wars versus Star Trek. I'll bring them to the show, and I'll sign them for you and put whatever you want on them. Awesome, awesome. I, I now I, I I remembered my question. Oh, good. <laughs> now the que the question was. You're you're working on these books like you know, uh, um, Ghost Recon Online, and and you're working on some of these other other books for these other publishing companies, and you're involving canon for these different storylines, and this is because this is going to be kind of like this is going to be what what's happened in this particular universe's timeline. Is that a lot of pressure? Do you get a lot of pressure from fans to make sure you get it right all the time, or or do you just gotta go? Yeah. It's, uh, I get more pressure, I think, from my editors to make sure I get it right, right? Uh, because the editors are the guys who live, eat, breathe, and die uh, based on this stuff. And they generally know the stuff better than I'm going to ever know it. And honestly, some of the worlds I write in, I will never know it as well as some of the fans, right? But some of the fans are just such diehards about this stuff that there's no way I could possibly be as good at it as they are. Um, because I just don't spend as much of my time on it. I'm, I'm working in a lot of different worlds. And they're focused on this one world that they think is the best, and more power to them, right? Um, but I do, I do feel concerned about that. I always feel like I owe people, uh, I, I need to do the research, I need to make sure I'm getting everything right as best as I possibly can, and I may, need to make them feel like uh, I'm giving them my best at every point, right? Uh, first thing I do when I get any kind of assignment like that, if I'm not already a fan of the property, which I often am, uh, is to sit down and immerse myself in it and just suck as, as much of it up into my head as I possibly can and try to figure out what's the most exciting thing about it. What is it that gets people to love this property? What gets them to love this franchise? Uh, what gets them to tune in every week or hit the theater or read the books or buy the comics or whatever? Why is this exciting though? If I could figure that out, uh, then I could tap into it myself and bring that to what I'm working on too. And I think that's essential. You need to become a fan of the property just as much as any other fan. Uh, you don't have to be hardcore, dedicated, you know, costume up, go to conventions kind of guy. But you do need to be somebody who cares about it a lot and you can understand mm -hmm. why. Otherwise, I think you're cheapening the whole thing. Now, you, any creative effort, a lot of people put work into. And I think you need to respect that when you're coming to that and trying to add to it. Cool. No, good answer. I, I just, I, I've just, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, some guys, Brent Spiners of the world, you know, if I will, who are a little bit bitter sometimes about the, the roles. Um, and uh, it's, I can understand if you've been pigeonholed in that one role, no, and people only ever see you as like that. It can be rough. On oh. the other hand, you know, most people aren't that lucky. Right? Yeah. 
But I hard to complain too much. I, I, I just remember the scene from uh, Galaxy. So that's pretty much all they write nowadays. Yeah. But again, they love writing the Star Wars novels. Troy Denning, Aaron Alston, Paul Kemp. You know, these guys were writing a bunch of that stuff. And they love doing it. And you can see that when they're writing. And that's yeah. not a bad thing. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I, because I, I, I didn't quite um, read all of the um, new Jedi Order books. Yeah, yeah. And I still, I, I don't know who was responsible, but I'm still mad at the guy who dropped a moon on Chewbacca. <laughs> that was Bob Salvatore, R.A. Salvatore, right? Uh, or Salvatore, as people often mispronounce. But um, Bob was instructed to do that by George Lucas himself, right? He didn't, uh, he didn't want to do it. In fact, he argued against it. But uh, the deal was, we want you to do something that's going to be, we want a really good author, like Bob, to write something that's going to be a, uh, an amazing moment in Star Wars. And something that they knew was eventually going to have to happen, right? Eventually all the characters will get killed off at one point or another in whatever history. Um, I don't think it's going to happen for most of them for years, but I think they said, okay, Chewbacca is probably the oldest of the whole crew. Let's tell the story of his ending. And, you know, Bob get death threats over that, honestly. I'm I, crazy about I, that. But <laughs> I, this, see, that's not the story I heard. I, okay. heard. I heard Lucas didn't know about it. No, bull. And, and and now because of that, all books have to be read by approved by Lucas before they get published. Oh, they were being approved a long time before that. If not by George directly, then by his handpicked people, right? Oh. Um, there, there's a whole uh, book at uh, who's the publisher now? Is uh, not coming to me. It used to be Bantam Del Rey. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but the publisher, uh, I think it's just Bantam now, but. Okay, the publisher does a great job of this stuff. They, they have people who are experts on this material that always make sure it's vetted all the way through. And they have to get everything approved by Lucasfilm before they go to press. Before they, even, they have to have an outline approved before they can have, have the guy start to write, right? right. And uh, I've heard this from Bob himself. So he's, I don't think he's got any incentive to lie about the fact that it wasn't his idea. You know, He's the kind of guy who would own it if it was his idea. Uh, but no, I mean, it can't... It may not have been Lucas's idea originally to kill him. It may have been somebody else in the book department someplace, right? But it had Lucas's stamp of approval uh, when it came to Bob, and he said, we want you to do this. And he said, okay. And I'm not sure if he regrets that. He kind of goes, ah, you know. Mm. Uh, it, you know sure, he loved writing the book. It was uh, a good paycheck for him, I'm sure. But, oh. And, you know, it's a good, fun story background world to play in. Mm. Uh, I don't know if he would have predict, done it if he could have predicted the backlash he'd have gotten from it. Well, I, I think I think anytime you kill a little off a popular character like that, there is going to be oh, yeah. some sort of backlash. It's just uh, who does not love Chewbacca? Oh, I know. I mean, he's one of the he's the <laughs> best character in, it in so many ways. He's everybody's friend, right? Right. Uh, it's like Snoopy and Charlie Brown and the Peanuts, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, see, I can see why people were upset about it, but to take it out personally on the Author, I think, is a mistake. I mean, it's, yeah. again, nobody who writes these kind of books has final say over what's going on. They can propose ideas. They can uh, say, let's try this. But the general rule when you write any of this kind of stuff or any episodic television or anything like that is that you're allowed to take the toys off the shelf, play around with them all you want, but then you have to put them back on the shelf in roughly the condition in which you found them. Right. right? Killing off a major character does not qualify for that. <laughs> so that's something that has to be approved all the way up and down the line. Right. Um, so I, I would be stunned to find out that that was slip past or snuck past. And, well, the thing is, you know Bob, so I don't. So this, this is yeah. just what I heard through some rumor mills and fan base, you know, fan base stuff. I mean, you guys are the author. You guys, you guys travel in these different circles. You guys know who's who in the business. So I'm going to take your word for it, and I'll take okay. it. I'll, I, will. I wasn't leaning over Bob's shoulder when it happened. So, you know, this is not a testimony foldable in a court of law, but... Knowing the guys involved and how this kind of stuff works, there's zero chance that he actually stood up and said, I'm going to kill Chewbacca and we'll slip it past Lucas before anybody notices. it. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, but you know what I would like to see from what I read, have read from the new, new Jedi Order? I would love, because they're, they're talking about um, after, after they 3 DFI. All the right, Star yeah. all the Star Wars movies, they're actually going to work on start working on three more, oh, and cool. and I would love for them to be the one about the Yu Zhang Vong War. That yeah, would be awesome, because awesome. I think with Wait, Lucas has, has 
proven that he's willing to just throw out anything in the expanded universe if he doesn't want to do it, right? Right. I mean, uh, when they started doing the prequels, it threw all the guys who have been doing books into a tizzy because they had built up this long history and everything else. And Lucas just like, no, I want it this way. And you can understand that. It's his baby. And, you know, things that he signed off on, if they don't fit with his vision for the film, he's allowed to change it, right? Right. Um, well, I, so you that, may look at that stuff with the Jedi Order or whatever and say, eh, not so much. But let's hope that he actually works it in there somehow. I think it would be very cool if he could. Yeah, well, I, the thing is is that um, I think if, if he truly wants to give Chewbacca the proper send-off, he's, mm -hmm. he's got to capture it on film. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, well, who knows? I mean, he told us for many years we weren't going to have any prequels, and now he's told us we won't have any sequels. But that doesn't mean it won't happen. Right? So. There's something about the almighty dollar that wins here. And yeah, you know, that's a guy who probably doesn't need any more of it, but I, I do think that this is, a, this is something that's near and dear to him personally, which is the reason he went back to it again in the first place. I mean, he finances all his own films. He doesn't need anybody to put up the couple hundred million dollars that he needs to make a film. Right. He has the cash. Uh, a very savvy guy that way. I have worked all that out ahead of time. But um, if he wants to make him, he can make him. I understand they're working on a live-action TV show, too. Uh, I've, I've been hearing story. about that. I've been hearing yeah. about that, and I got, uh, I got a, a friend of mine who has another friend, which we're all kind of close-knit, but we, who works actually on a Walker Ranch, a Skywalker Ranch. Ah, cool. And, and um, I have been told that he was working on the live-action show, but he actually got switched to working on Clone Wars. The, ah, okay. The, the thing for Cartoon Network. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, which is a great show, too. I think the what they what I've heard is that the scripts that they have are great scripts, but they don't think they can actually uh, live up to them with the current CGI costs mm -hmm. and such, the current special effects costs. So once those start to come down, which they, you know they come down every year, once right. they get down to the right level, then they'll be able to start filming them. And I'm hoping to do that within the next three years or so, maybe five. Well, uh, I mean, I mean, I would seen some of the fan stuff they've just been able to do with just uh, you know some kid and too much time with After Effects, and that's been pretty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Been pretty darn good, so. Um, oh, it's it, impressive, you know. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping because if they could come out with just like a regular serial uh, for Star Wars, it would really fill the gap that Star Trek's left behind on television at the moment. Oh yeah, exactly. It's kind of sad that there's not a major science fiction show on TV right now. I, I mean, uh, even Stargate's off the air, which is on for longer than any other SF show. Actually, no, Universe is still there. Star I thought it went off here. I I heard it was going to be canceled, but um, the guys at the um, what's that media center out in New York? What's the name of them? Um, Paley. Okay. Uh, the, those guys, because they're the ones who track trends and have connections with a whole bunch of people. Uh, uh, they said that Stargate Universe is still going to be on, but I could be wrong. Um, not everybody. Get... But yeah, you know, again, I'm I'm not a. A, uh, the last word on all these things either. So. Uh, no, and, and neither am I. I, I, I mean, I, like I said, I don't get paid to do this. I do it for the love, and I, I, I keep my ear to the ground, though, um, on stuff. But uh, if, um, and I really liked Stargate Universe. I, 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 I was kind of disappointed they killed Atlantis to make this show. Because Atlantis, to me, was a very, very, very good show. And I understand um, why SG-1 kind of went to the movie thing, you know, to the directed DVD yeah. movie thing. But I think that was a smart choice because you got two guys who are doing most of the planning and writing for this universe. They can't do everything, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, so, but they should have kept Atlantis going. I, I think there was still a lot more story to tell there. They hadn't completely eradicated the Wraith yet. I just thought there was a lot more story to go there. And Universe, Star Stargate Universe, I, to yeah. me, I thought that was very well done. It kind of went back, it went back to what, the, uh, what I thought the vision was from the original movie. It was, right. a, it was a little bit more personal. It got you into the characters' heads a little bit more. And it kind of it made you kind of understand some of the inner workings of at least of what um, what the writers from Stargate SG One and Atlantis had about the inner working and politics type stuff that goes on right. 
with um, with uh, um, you know home or home planet or whatever security whatever they called it in the show I can't remember right. but I mean with IEA and all those things and kind of how that kind of works together and kind of made you understand those pieces because you're like going who are these guys where did they come from why are they getting to decide stuff and this kind of helps you understand how the politicking happens there and it was it was more of a it was more of a dramatization of a science fiction show what kind of by the star galactic if you will um, yeah exactly and which another good show, by the way, um, which I really oh, yeah. enjoyed. Of course, it did get weird at the end. I will admit. <laughs> I will admit. Uh, a lot of shows do, right? I mean, you got uh, the writers and the, and the uh, creators or the showrunners are always trying to cram as much as they possibly can into the end of the show, right? And try to explain everything that happened for it. I mean, think about Lost in the last season, for instance, right? Just think about all this stuff they try to cram into there at the last second because they want they knew this was their last chance to tell these stories. And most of the times when you're doing a TV show, you don't know that it's going to be your last season like that. You just kind of, you know, somebody tells you, oh, uh, by the way, you're ending, we just canceled, you got three episodes, go. <laughs> you're lucky if you actually get to do anything. Sometimes they don't right. give you that much time. Well, I like, I like what they did when they canceled um, Enterprise. Um, yeah. they, they, did, they did the Mirror Universe, which I thought, exactly. I actually, by far... That was like a thing. Okay, let's just do something we've been wanting to do this whole show and just finally do it, right? right and yeah. I, and and I think but yeah, no reason why not. Why not cut loose at this point? Yeah. Right? But I think that was the best episode of the whole series. Of That's all three, all... it's when you actually take the rest of the, uh, the, the problems away. You say all the restraints are gone now because you have nothing to lose. Right. And that's when people come up with some crazy stuff. Spider Man was that way actually. Uh, that was a uh, when Stan Lee wrote the original Spider Man comic. In Amazing Fantasy, it was the last issue of Amazing Fantasy. He's like, here's this idea for a story. It's just a toss off. Who the hell knows? But it became so popular that you know now. Look at it now. Look at Spider Man now. Now that you, well, now you mentioned Spider Man, you know what's doing to him, right? Which you mean the death of Spider Man or something else? Yes. Yes, I've seen that. Yeah. Why? Why would you do that? Well, it's the ultimate universe, so you can play around with those kind of things in a way you couldn't possibly do in normal continuity, right? Um, but I think you know, it's Brian Bendis. He's out there. He's always trying to do new, different things. I think he's he's that's a guy who knows. He does the best dialogue in comics, period. Right? He does right. some amazing stuff. Um, and he's always got interesting ideas for plots and such. But I think after you. You know, been working in a, a series like he's done Ultimate Spider-Man up to issue 160 something now. Mm -hmm. uh, he's probably saying, "Let's mess around with this some. Let's play around with the expectations people have." No, I mean, come on, it gets them all sorts of media exposure too. People get really excited about that. They're like, "What the hell's going on?" Well, it was like the death uh, of Superman. Superman. And the death of Superman, the same way. You know, they killed Batman off a few years ago. They killed Captain America off a few years ago. They brought Bucky back for crying out loud. Come on. <laughs> That was the one character they always said would, was dead permanently. Right. But there you go. Well, I mean, they, they say when a Marvel character dies, he dies. But you mentioned there are differentiators because you said the ultimate Spider-Man because you got the Amazing Spider-Man right. series, which may still continue on, even though that one's right. been, been died off. Universe, it's a whole different universe. It's separated right. from the standard Marvel universe, right? Right. One of the things I didn't tell you is that a couple of years ago, I revised the Marvel Encyclopedia for DK. Uh, publishing, so okay. uh, for the 2009 editions. I read a lot of comic books in those days. That must have been got, fun. It was a terrible, terrible burden, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a hell of a tax right now. Now, I had a great time. I'm, I'm a big Marvel fan from way back anyway, right? Yeah. I had a DC fan and an Image fan and an IDW fan, comic book fan all the way through. Yeah. Uh, but having worked on that, you know, there's there are certain different universes within the Marvel publishing world. And the Ultimate Universe is set up to be a younger version, essentially, of the standard Marvel Universe, in which the characters look a lot alike, sometimes act a lot alike, the ones you're used to, but are substantially different in a lot of ways, too. So it allows them to take people and kill them off like this, even major characters like Spider-Man, and play around with them and see if they can do anything new with them. Right. Um, and I think, you know, from a creative point of view, that's kind of cool. Uh, you know, and a guy like Bendis has earned his chance to do that kind of thing. I mean, he's been working with these characters for... A long time now, and right. nobody knows him better than he does as far as that goes, um, as far as the Ultimate Spider-Man goes, which he's been writing the entire time. So I trust him. You know, let him work it out see what the hell he does with it. Okay. I'm interested to read it. Well, I, I, I want to see how it pans out as well, because I, I really I did like the Doomsday story with the death of Superman. Um, I, didn't yeah. I didn't catch up on the death of Batman. Um, I, I, Superman's always been my favorite superhero. So I I think I I think I actually still have 
the death of Superman comic book somewhere in the Black Mylar. <laughs> somewhere. But not in the black bag, right? <laughs> oh, well, no, it, it's, it's, it's cut because you've got to pull it out right. so it doesn't disintegrate because... You've got to read it. Well, you've got to read it. Well, not only that, but the, 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 actually the um, acid from the coloring on the inside of the bag would, would have yeah. eaten through the comic book and totally ruined it. That's true. Those were pretty cheap bags back then. Yeah, so they didn't, uh, they weren't, I don't think they were mate thinking when they uh, made that. Um, well, they were thinking about archival quality. So right. <laughs> the comic books, are, especially back then, printed on the worst mm. kind of paper possible, right? Yeah. Um, nowadays, they're printed on some pretty amazing paper, but it's still not acid-free stuff. It's going to stand the test of time. Yeah. And, but, you know, back in the, in the 70s, early 80s, 90s, whatever, is basically just cheap newsprint, a couple steps above that. Now it's pretty good stuff. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I actually, I've gone digital with my comic books. You know, I just started doing that. We picked up an iPad a few weeks ago, and man, is it amazing. I mean, it's a great reading experience. You don't have to worry about storing the things afterwards. Uh, if you're a reader, it's fantastic. If you're a collector, I can see why it doesn't work for you, right? right? But as someone who just likes the stories and doesn't really care about the artifacts itself, I love it. It's fantastic. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it's going to allow for a whole new generation of comic book readers and allow for people who normally wouldn't read comic books because it yeah, exactly. it saves them from having to trudge down to the local comic book shop. You know, of course you can yeah, I mean you can pick up comic books down at you know Barnes and Noble and things like that, but it's not something you think of when when you yeah, when, when you go stores, like Barnes and Noble, your, your grocery stores, whatever. They don't carry comics the way they used to back uh, you know ten twenty years ago. So I mean, if you really want to be a comic book fan, you have to have a local comic book store near you, right? Right. And not every part of the country has that, right? right. Not everybody lives near, uh, within an easy drive of a comic book store, or as a subscription service, or as a poll service, or whatever. Yeah. Plus, the uh, the digital ones tend to be cheaper, right? Because you're not worried about returns, you're not worried about shipping, you're not worried about printing costs and the risks that go along with having to guess what your inventory right. should be. Yeah, I can. So, I can pick it up. It's going be a fantastic deal for everybody. Yeah, I can pick up the latest like Spider Man or Superman for like ninety nine cents. I mean, yeah, you can't. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't think you can beat that. But I, I'm looking at the time, no. Matt, and we didn't even get to uh, do Q and A with the audience. Uh oh. Um, okay. Chris, I'm not Did sure. Any <laughs> but um, thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate it. And um, yeah, no problem. And and if you're if you're watching this or if you're watching the. Um, Recording on YouTube. Don't forget to check out Matt at forbeck.com. That's f o r b e c k dot com, and or follow him on Twitter m forbeck. And um, just again, thank you for your time. The book is uh, Star Wars versus Star Trek, and um, you know, great. And we'd like to anytime you got something new coming on, we'd love to have you come on the show and talk about it, man. I appreciate it, James. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem, Matt. Thank you. No